My name is Celia Vucolo. I'm the Wildlife Habitat and Stewardship Specialist for the Piedmont Environmental Council. Um, I'm also the co-chair for the Plant Northern Piedmont Natives Campaign, uh, which I'm going to be talking about today. And uh, Chris gave you a pretty good introduction about some of the work PEC has been doing over the years um, towards you know, promoting native plants and conserving habitats. Um, and you know, this initiative is uh, it's fairly new. Um, it was rebooted uh, about two years ago, the, the campaign. Um, some of you may be familiar with our Piedmont Natives Plant Guide. I'm gonna talk a little bit about that later. Uh, it's very popular, um, kind of gives you some uh, ideas for what species to plant in your gardens and landscapes. And I also wanted to give a quick shout out to my co-chair, Beth Mizell, who is the vice president of the Jefferson chapter of the Virginia Native Plant Society. Some of you may know her. Um, she's also the new program director for the Blue Ridge PRISM, which is the Partnership for Regional Invasive Species Management. So um, Beth and I both wear many hats, but we work very well together to um, promote native plants. So how are we doing? Good. All right, I think we're ready to go. <laughs> okay, so I uh, already did my introductions here. So here's some, um, a picture of me. I already kind of gave you the run through about that. Um, I do work out of our uh, headquarters office in Warrington, Virginia, which as Chris mentioned is, it's now currently closed, but normally that's uh, where I operate out of. Um, here's a brief overview of today's talk. So my goal is to have you all leave today's presentation feeling pretty inspired and determined um, to help protect and restore our local biodiversity and to perhaps even join our campaign um, effort to raise awareness on native plants. But before we talk plants, uh, I'd like to introduce you all to the Piedmont Environmental Council or PEC. Some of you may already be familiar with our work, but for those of you who aren't, PEC's mission is broad and multifaceted. Um, we are a 501c3 nonprofit focused on the protecting the Northern Piedmont of Virginia's natural resources, rural economy, history, and beauty. I like to say that we work to enhance the quality of life for Piedmont residents. PEC works in a nine county region that includes Loudoun, Clark, Fauquier, Madison, Culpeper, Orange, Green, Albemarle, and Rappahannock counties. Our region is unique. PEC is close to the DC metropolitan area, which sits just to the east of us, and Shenandoah National Park and the rural Virginia farm country are to the west. Our landscape is composed of farms, forests, thriving towns, and suburban communities. Our role in the region is to engage and educate and empower residents to become strong advocates. We believe that communities should have an active role in land use decision making and natural resource protection on the state, local, and county level. I oversee our sustainable habitat program, which is focused on the restoration and protection of natural resources. Our program is made up of three pillars. One is the management of our three conservation properties, which serve as demonstration sites for a wide variety of best management practices for natural resource management. Two is our outreach and education to the public on habitat and land stewardship issues via interpretive walks and talks, presentations and site visits. And three, landscape and watershed, watershed scale restoration initiatives, which are built on partnerships with other organizations and agencies that target specific restoration goals in a landscape. When I think about our habitat program, there's one common thread that runs through it, the conservation of native plants. Native plants are plants that have evolved with our ecosystems over millions of years. They are indigenous to our environment. Because they have been a part of our landscape for so long, animal species have developed and co-evolved with them, creating special relationships, some so special that they cannot exist without the other. Native plants are the building blocks of wildlife habitat, but they also clean water and hold soil. They provide food and are also forage for livestock. 
and they provide us with enjoyment, peace of mind, and a sense of place, which is important now more than ever. They are the fabric that hold the natural world and our world together. As I was developing this presentation, I opened my copy of Bringing Nature Home by Doug Tallamy, looking for some inspiration. He had signed the first page at one of the many speaking events of his that I have attended over the years, and his inscription struck me. It's such a simple statement, but it holds so much value and urgency because life does depend on how we garden, how we care for our backyards, our landscapes. Scientists like Talamy have been amplifying this message of urgency over the past five years with new and startling research. One of the most crushing reports on biodiversity loss came last year when a Smithsonian report found that almost 3 billion birds or one in four birds has been lost from North America since 1970. This is a loss that has occurred across a broad spectrum of bird species with diverse habitat preferences and life histories. And it's been a rallying cry for the conservation community. 2017 saw the first headline on what the media has dubbed the insect apocalypse. This was due to a German paper that found that in 30 years, 80% of flying insects in German nature preserves had disappeared. The cause was unknown, but researchers hypothesized that heavy development and land use change around the preserves played a major role. This created a wave of concern with more research gaining media attention, including a 2019 study that found 40% of insect species are declining globally. And lastly, we have the ongoing sixth mass extinction event, which the scientific community believes is driving massive global biodiversity losses. The last extinction event occurred with the die off of the dinosaurs, just to give you some perspective. Extinction events are broadly characterized as being caused by a significant environmental event and ending with the loss of over three quarters of the species from the planet. Typically new species are lost over the course of hundreds of thousands, if not millions of years, which gives new species time to evolve, move in. The sixth mass extinction event is significant because the rate of species loss is happening at an accelerated pace that outpaces the ability for new species to evolve. And it is clear that human impacts on the environment are what is causing it. So let's consider Doug Tallamy's quote again. Does it ring truer now? It does for me. So I thought I would share a story of my own backyard with you. It starts with the native coral honeysuckle that grows on the side of my garden shed. For anyone who hasn't seen the species before, it is a beautiful fast growing vine that does well on a trellis and is a fantastic hummingbird plant. Anyway, I noticed a caterpillar on it this past spring, which is the larva of the snowberry clearwing moth. Coral honeysuckle is one of the larval host plants for this species, meaning that this moth's pupa has evolved to feed off of the leaves of this plant and a few others. This plant acts as a nursery for these caterpillars. A few weeks after I noticed that caterpillar, I went out to view a patch of wild bergamot on one of my computer breaks from work and found both the adult snowberry clearwing and its close cousin, the hummingbird clearwing. They are both hawk moths and very curious looking creatures. Sometimes they are confused for actual hummingbirds because their wings beat so fast. They have a long proboscis or tongue that is perfectly designed to access nectar from the long corollas of flowers like wild bergamot, bee balm, coral honeysuckle, phlox, etc. This specialized morphology is an important example of the relationship between native plants and animals. Taking you back in time a bit, bees split off from wasps when they began to specialize feeding pollen and nectar to their larvae as opposed to insect prey a wasp behavior trait, which was about 100 million years ago. Bees began to diversify at the same time that flowering plants were, which is shown as the gray funnel on the chart. We began seeing fossil specimens of bees with pollen around 140 million years ago, which is shown by the small dotted line. There is a direct link between flowering plant evolution and bee evolution, 
meaning that essentially they drove the evolution of each other's physical characteristics. What this looks like today is a concept called pollinator syndromes, or as I like to call it, who likes what? Flowers and bees were figuring each other out over millions of years, and all that work led to mutually beneficial relationships between pollinators and plants. Flowers developed physical traits that either provided access to their pollen or nectar for the right pollinator, or blocked access to inefficient pollinators, all of which was determined by the likelihood of that pollinator to be successful in assisting in the flower's reproduction strategy. For example, look at the column for butterflies. The, plant that want, the plants that want to attract butterflies are bright red and purple flowers, generally speaking, provide visual petal nectar guides and offer abundant nectar. Contrast that with flies, whose flower preferences have evolved to have brown or dark purple flowers with a putrid scent, think skunk cabbage, which mimic dead tissue and have no nectar since flies are interested only in pollen. The pollinator plant relationship is just one of the many important attributes of our native plants. But what if the caterpillar's fate went a different way? Putting pollination aside, insects are crucial to our natural food webs because they are an important link in the flow of energy. Energy from the sun is harnessed by plants, which are then consumed by insect herbivores which make up 30% of the Earth's animals. And virtually every animal species eats insects. For example, insects are 25% of the red fox's diet. And a whopping 96% of the bird species in North America feed caterpillars to their young. Our backyard birds rely on caterpillars and other insects to sustain their populations. Let me provide you with an example of this. Something else I noticed this last spring in the coral honeysuckle was a cardinal nest. Naturally, it got me thinking, how many clear wing caterpillars would two baby cardinals need to survive? Unfortunately, after some digging, I found out that cardinals carry their food to their young all mashed up and in the back of their bill, so there is no way to know what they are bringing to the nest. However, I can extrapolate the number of trips to the nest the parents take, knowing that each trip they are bringing insects so I can get an idea of how many insects are needed for this one clutch of eggs. So bear with me a moment through my calculations. An average clutch size for cardinals is three, three to four eggs. Parent birds will feed three to four young about five to six times an hour. Let's estimate for my nest of two eggs, they feed about four times an hour. Let's calculate that over four hours, which was how long researchers observed over 10 days, which is the nestling time period for cardinals. The parents made 160 trips to two nestlings in just four hours. In order to estimate the number of trips needed to rear a clutch of nestlings, let's multiply eight hours a day by 10 days, which gives us 320 trips. It's a lot of caterpillars. So you have to figure that, like I said, every time they come back, they may, maybe they are bringing one caterpillar or beetles or two lace wings, whatever it is, then imagine this is just one nest and think of all the birds you see at your house, on your block, in your town, et cetera. It's a lot of mouths to feed. The importance of bringing native plants back into our backyards cannot be overstated. Doug Townley says that if half of American lawns were replaced with native plants, we would create the equivalent of a 20 million acre national park, nine times bigger than Yellowstone or 100 times bigger than Shenandoah National Park. To put this into perspective, consider this map of US land ownership. The purple areas are federal lands. The rest is private or state county owned land. In the east, the majority of our land falls into this last category. So biodiversity conservation work cannot happen without the cooperation of private landowners. And in the East, a lot of privately owned land is parcelized, fragmented, and degraded. PEC's region, for example, sits close to one of the most heavily populated areas of the country. The Piedmont of Virginia is a crucial landscape and promoting native gardens, land stewardship, and restoration can provide important habitat for many species. So much of our landscape looks like this. 
small wild or forested areas surrounded by roads, which form sinks for isolated wildlife populations. This is especially detrimental to species that have low pre-productive rates and are susceptible to vehicle strikes, like the eastern box turtle, whose entire territory is roughly a quarter square mile. Or the landscape looks like this, disconnected forest blocks and overgrazed fields. Note the brown areas in some of the pastures in this photo, which is exposed ground. I'd just like to mention too that PEC and our partners at Smithsonian's Virginia Working Landscapes Program and the American Farmland Trust are working with farmers to help them employ sustainable farming and grazing practices in order to minimize habitat loss. No matter where you live, adding native plants to your landscape can help connect habitat, which assists all kinds of species in moving across the landscape. This is important for migration, mating, young dispersal, food access, and for animals seeking refuge from climate events. As impacts from climate change intensify and storm drought and heat events become more common, many wildlife species are particularly vulnerable if they can't seek new habitat. In short, wildlife needs to be able to move safely and efficiently. Connections are important because in PEC's region, we have a very large piece of permanently protected habitat, Shenandoah National Park, which is circled here in red. This map was created about 15 years ago by PEC and shows possible wildlife corridors that follow river corridors that connect to the park and are permanently protected for conservation easements. I know some of you are probably thinking, well, I live in a townhouse with a tiny yard, what value is that? Well, let me describe the value of just one native plant. It's aster season right now, so I chose to highlight this group of species. Native aster in our region are typically from two genera and support a wide variety of animal species. They are the host plants for six specialist bees and support caterpillars of 112 species of moths and butterflies. They are important members of several endemic plant communities and are highly attractive to butterflies and bumblebees. I like to say that there is a native aster for every situation, shade, sun, wet or dry, and they bloom during the fall when other flowering species are scarce. If you added just a few asters to your townhouse yard, you would be making a difference for your local pollinator populations. And as a matter of fact, this photo I have here of aromatic aster is on the front steps of my old townhouse, which was in Bristow, Prince William County. To further emphasize this point, PEC's headquarters in Warrington is home to a three quarter acre native plant garden. In 2017 and 18, I led a citizen science effort that counted groups of pollinating insects and recorded what species they were found on. This survey reported over 1,600 pollinating insects over a three month period, which shows that even small plantings can support an abundance of pollinators. At the corner of Avon Street Extended and Route 20, south of Charlottesville, Virginia, you can spot a patch of little blue stem grass, late purple aster, and an assortment of other Piedmont native species. This site has been identified by the Center of Urban Habitats, a partner of the Plant Northern Piedmont Natives Campaign, as the remnant Piedmont grassland site. These small grassland communities, which have miraculously avoided human disturbance, are valuable to our region's biodiversity. These plants are not only native, but have evolved together to create plant communities, which in turn support a very specific suite of vertebrate and invertebrate populations. Oftentimes the plant or animals found in these remnant grasslands are imperiled and or endangered. This is another example of a Piedmont plant community, the Piedmont Mafic Barren. It is a globally imperiled plant community restricted to the Virginia Piedmont. And this community of plants cannot be found anywhere else in the world. It's characterized by its base rock, which is rich in magnesium and iron, making it only inhabitable to certain types of plants. My point is that it's not just about planting native, it's also about protecting what's left, educating yourself, selecting the right plant for the right place and working to transform your landscape into a functioning plant community. This is done by selecting plants that naturally exist together. If you're interested in learning more about the identification and protection of these heritage sites, visit the Center for Urban Habitat.
we need to change the way we think about our landscapes. But how do we go about doing that on a large scale? That's where the Plant Northern Piedmont Natives campaign comes in. We know that behavior can be changed by creating a shift in social norms. In this case, it is achieved by changing what is considered aesthetically acceptable as a landscape. A model for social change called community-based social marketing is built on the idea that sustainable behavior change is best achieved at the community level. Information sharing is not true education. Education happens when the community learns through shared experience and validation which in part happens when barriers to social change are removed. The Virginia Native Plant Marketing Partnership, which is the umbrella initiative for the regional plant campaigns, built its strategy on community-based social marketing. The partnership is led by the Coastal Zone Management Program of the Department of Environmental Quality and also the Department of Wildlife Resources, and it focuses on state-level initiatives surrounding the promotion of native plants. Plant Northern Piedmont Natives is one of nine regional campaigns that make up the Commonwealth. Some of the campaigns in the West have not been formalized yet, while the campaigns in the East were some of the first to take shape in Virginia. The Eastern Shore campaign was the first and has been an example for other campaigns that have followed. They, along with some of our other campaigns, have developed initiatives like native plant tags that volunteers place in pots of natives that are being sold at garden centers, so that customers can easily find them. In order to build momentum and change attitudes on native landscaping, our sister campaign, Plant Nova Natives, discovered through a marketing survey that there are a couple of major barriers. The first being a lack of education or awareness with natives, no surprises there, followed by the lack of availability of natives for local purchase and also publicly accessible demonstration sites where people can see what a native plant, native landscape looks like. Armed with the knowledge of these three barriers, which tend to be the same across most campaigns regions, six objectives were developed. These goals seek to make natives popular, increase knowledge of natives, engage garden centers and nurseries on the, and the sale of natives, and engage in planning decisions that would impact the conservation and installation of native landscapes. The original Piedmont Natives team formed in Albemarle in 2012 with a vision for promoting Piedmont native plants for use in landscapes and gardens. And the campaign was rebooted in early 2019, which I mentioned in the beginning of the presentation. The original team put together the popular Piedmont Natives plant guide which features Piedmont native plants that are ideal for gardens and landscaping projects. Trees, shrubs, grasses, ferns, vines, and wildflowers are all listed in the guide, along with their growing requirements and wildlife associations. The guide can be purchased at the Thomas Jefferson Soil and Water Conservation District or through the Virginia Native Plant Society. If you're interested in purchasing it through PEC and picking it up at the Warrington or Charlottesville office, Please contact me first to arrange pickups since the office is currently closed. It's also available online for free download on our website, which I have listed here on this slide, and I'll show it again at the end of the slideshow. Another resource developed by the campaign is the Piedmont Natives Database, which provides information about natives for restoration and landscaping projects. Again, I have the website listed here, but we'll show it at the end of the presentation. As I mentioned, this project was reorganized in 2019 into an official native plant campaign. It is a regional partner driven effort that is built on the collaboration of supporting state, federal, and local agencies, nonprofits, private business, county government, and other groups. The campaign covers 11 counties in the Piedmont region. The strength of this campaign is predicated by partnerships. We have 28 participating partners in the campaign and the list is growing. The diverse set of agencies, organizations, and private businesses strengthen the campaign and bring a variety of resources and expertise. All of these groups work towards the conservation of native plants in one way or another. And the campaign will help bring resources and build capacity for these organizations to expand their work. The more we work together, the more we can get accomplished. 
After months of organizing, I, along with my co-chair, Beth Mizell of the Jefferson Chapter of the Virginia Native Plant Society, held a kickoff meeting for our partner groups in the summer of 2019. We had over 40 attendees and through a series of speakers and pointed discussion, we identified goals and actions that would make the biggest impact in getting more native plants into Piedmont landscapes. This meeting helped us to develop a campaign action plan and identify four work groups that would tackle the various barriers to getting more natives on the ground. Our action plan is distilled into three buckets, point of sale, outreach, and education. The work groups help develop specific objectives and actions for each of these topics. Policy work aims to help partners and individuals to track state bills, work direct, directly with counties on land use policy, and state agencies on protection of public native plant resources and support of the native plant industry. The point of sale work group is focused on assessing what barriers local nurseries have to growing and selling natives, and also helping them to better market the natives they already have. Outreach and education work is very diverse and covers a lot of territory. Everything from traditional outreach programming to an interactive map of demonstration sites to a list of local contractors and native plant nurseries are all in development. Here's an example of the outreach and education group's six months action plan that was developed at the meeting. Each regional campaign goes through a branding effort that involves designing a logo, a slogan, social media platforms, and we already have a successful Facebook page, and simple outreach materials. These tools are essential to developing the campaign and our messaging. To date, the campaign has reworked our logo and developed outreach materials. And honestly, a lot of our work is just networking with partner organizations and helping each other promote what we are already doing. The plant Northern Piedmont Natives region is very conservation minded already, and we have several fantastic native plant nurseries and supportive county and state natural resource agencies that work with landowners every day. PEC and many of our partners have either facilitated, sponsored, or outright owned native plant demonstration sites in our region. The purpose of the campaign is to promote them while also assessing areas where demonstration sites may be needed. Our two partner soil and water conservation districts, the Thomas Jefferson and John Marshall districts, oversee the VCAP or Virginia Conservation Assistance Program, which is a great source of technical and financial support for residents in our region interested in converting lawn to native plants. Last but not least, we have a broad range of partners from the Master Gardeners to the Smithsonian's, Smithsonian's Virginia Working Landscapes Program that cover a vast spectrum of native plant education programming. The current pandemic crisis has forced us to rework and rethink a lot of our goals and timelines. We are all currently living in a virtual world and as such, the campaign's presence will have to be mostly virtual for the time being. However, we still need your help. I'd like to close this presentation with a call to action. If you're interested in volunteering with our campaign, please let us know. You don't need to be a part of our partner organization. Private citizens are welcome. We are looking for folks with a variety of skills, not necessarily native plant experts to join us. For example, if you have graphic design skills or have a background in policy work or communication, we would love to have you on our team. There's still so much opportunity for education, policy work and outreach that can be accomplished virtually. I'm gonna leave you with this great quote from Aldo Leopold, widely regarded as the father of wildlife conservation because I think it shows how taking action does not need to be grand or complicated. It just involves picking up a shovel. Email me if you're interested in volunteering or have any follow-up questions. And I really appreciate you all joining me and bearing with us through some of the technical difficulties we had in the beginning. Um, and it looks like we have time for some questions. Um, if you're interested, you can type some in the chat and I think Marco is gonna take it from here.